Miss Danielle uh, alluded to it, uh, uh, for about four years in the Air Force during the peak of the Vietnam era. He returned to Essex Superior Court and has been a stalwart in our court system ever since. He's worked, worked under three clerks in, in Essex Superior Court, Phil Hennessy, Herb Levesque, Jim Leary, and of course ultimately he became Chief of Staff of the Trial Court. Somehow he found time to get his bachelor's degree at Salem State College, then known as Salem State University. He also found time, as you heard a bit about it, to get married to his lovely wife, uh, Anne, and to have three lovely daughters, and as well as their grandchildren. Um, I don't know how he found the time to do that. I first met Bob in 1973, when I started practicing law on the North Shore. He already was a respected leader of the court by that time, and for good reason. He's smart, he's great with people, he's respectful, he listens, and he is unflappable. There was no one who had any, anything but the highest regard for Bob, again, for good reason. Bob got it then, continued to get it, and still does. He understood then and has understood throughout his career what it means to be a public servant. The public are his clients. He always has had that as his focus, even in the face of stupid questions, sometimes from people like me. Or stupid behavior. Bob never lost sight of that focus. With a smile, good grace, and a full understanding of what it means to serve the public, he would answer even the stupid questions, and would largely, not always, but largely ignore the stupid behavior. Uh, even though I may not always be the quickest study, it soon became evident to me that there was no one in the Essex Superior Court Clerk's Office who had a better understanding of court practices and procedures than Bob as well as a practical understanding of the workings of the clerk's office itself. He was, for many of us, and paraphrasing or quoting actually Chief Justice Rouse, the go-to guy when we had questions about a court matter. Even when he couldn't help, he still was helpful. By that I mean there are certain matters, as everyone in this room knows, that just have to take their own course, play out as they will. Bob understood that and could be reassuring even when, indicate, even when indicating there wasn't anything he could do. Of course, being reassuring was helpful by itself. Bob always has treated everyone with dignity and respect, recognizing that everyone interacting with the court system is entitled to equal treatment. He has been a role model in that regard. Bob has not tooted his own horn. As accomplished and as talented as he is, he is modest to a fault. I long have felt that any organization would function much better if there simply were more Bob candidates to fill positions. Bob also knows the meaning and value of discretion. I could recount a number of instances where Bob was, shall we say, very helpful to prominent folks, who I'm quite sure remain very grateful to this day for Bob's assistance. I have a particular image indelibly etched in my brain that encapsulate, encapsulates Bob as the consummate professional and consummate family man he is. Over the years from time to time, the Panatons and the Holloways would find themselves skiing at Sunday River. Among Bob's talents is that he is an accomplished athlete, including being an excellent skier. On one occasion when Danielle was in elementary school, Bob and Danielle were on the chairlift ahead of me at Lock Mountain at Sunday River. It was a very cold and windy day, and that area was noted for being especially windy at the top. Given the wind and the cold, the discharge area at the top of the lift was very icy, as Bob will recall. As Danielle and Bob were getting off the chair, a tremendous gust of wind caught Danielle, and there was a huge drop-off just ahead, and I mean a huge drop-off. I never saw anyone move faster or more athletically than Bob did, as he raced after Danielle to grab her and to prevent her from being literally blown off the mountain. And then, right after that, we all, in a kind of matter-of-fact way, skied down the mountain together. To me, that did and does speak volumes about Bob. He and I have joked about that occasion over the years, but in many ways, it was just another day at the office for Bob, who, without hesitation, immediately did the right thing in that particular instance, looking after and protecting his daughter, and thereafter not looking for me, looking for or expecting any praise or accolades for doing so. The fact is that I have learned a great deal from Bob Paddington over the years, not just about the court system, but also about life and family and I'm not the only one. So the court system will be losing a gem, ladies and gentlemen. 
someone who started his career in our system some 50 years ago. That latter observation, I can tell you, was a bit daunting to me because it seems like just yesterday, those 40 years ago when I first met Bob. I thus have very mixed emotions on this occasion. I enthusiastically salute a great career in public service in our court system, and I congratulate Bob and applaud him for this great career. But our court system will be poorer with his retirement. Bob, I wish you all the best with Ann, Danielle, Michelle, and Aaron, and the grandkids, and the extended family. Good luck. Don't be a stranger. We will miss you, my friend. I'm sure you know that Bob Holloway is an excellent trial lawyer. He is also an accomplished pianist. Our wives, Jan and Peggy, belong to a group of ten women that get together once a month to play bunker. They throw dice, drink wine, and talk. <laughs> They rotate houses each month. Ann loves going to the hallways because while they're playing bunko, Bob is in the background playing entertaining classical music while they play. I think they say he is the bunko artist. <laughs> Yesterday, I started to pack my stuff and found some things I want to share with you. First is a certificate of employment, dated September 3rd, 1964, as a senior messenger to the Superior Court Clerk's Office in Salem, signed by Philip A. Hennessy, Clerk of Courts. The salary was $3,500 a year, or $290 per month. Now that was a lot of money back then for a 17-year-old man. I was living large. I was paid once a month, but I could take weekly cash draws. The only problem with that was by the end of the month, there was nothing left in my paycheck to pay for gas for my car. The next item I have is a program. It is from the first retirement party of many that I attended. The Essex County Bar Association sponsored a dinner for Charles Metcalf an assistant clerk in Salem with 52 years of dedicated service. Upon examining the program today compared to 50 years ago, I noticed some discrepancies. Primarily, the head table consisted of 33 people at the time. 32 men and one woman. The Honorable Jenny Woodman Barrett, Justice of the Superior Court. I'm very pleased to see that progress has been made since the 60s, with more women and minorities appointed to the bench. I believe we still have a ways to go. And lastly, I found the original autographed 1971 edition of the Handbook of Instructions for court officers and clerks of courts, prepared by the Honorable George P. Pott, Justice of the Superior Court. He liked everything a certain way. <laughs> it is 16 pages with 45 housekeeping topics 
from A to Z. On the first day of the session, Judge Pond announced to all in the courtroom that the time on the courtroom clock would be the official court time. He then instructed the court officer to synchronize the clock in his lobby with the clock in the courtroom. My two favorite instructions in the book, quote, no sleeping or apparent sleeping, <laughs> no court officer or deputy sheriff shall sleep or appear to be asleep in the courtroom. <laughs> the court officers shall be alert at all times to all proceedings in the courtroom. And my favorite is, uh, you may remember that a lot of our older courthouses have bells or buzzers in the lobby. And the judge would push the bell or buzzer to summons court staff. Well, Judge Pond had an instruction for that in his book as well. The signals by buzzer were, code officer would be one buzz, an assistant clerk would be two buzzes, and the stenographer would be three buzzes. And further, when answering the signal by buzzer, the person enters the judge's lobby immediately without knocking. If court officer, clerk, or stenographer initiates knock on lobby door, signal by buzzer then means come in. I <laughs> <laughs> must confess, there were times when we responded to the wrong number of buzzers. <laughs> Unintentionally, of course. <laughs> Judge, I get very upset. <laughs> I went to Judge Pond's retirement party and I congratulated him and his wife. Behind me in the receiving line was another assistant clerk from Bristol County. And I could tell he had been overserved. <laughs> when I heard him say to Mrs. Pond, I am assistant clerk so and so, and I am two buzzes. <laughs> How many buzzes are you? <laughs> now, this is not scripted. I didn't intend to say anything about this. In fact, I promised the Chief Justice I wouldn't mention this at all. But his boss, Tina, directed me to talk about it. And she brought me the prop that I needed. About a year ago, we were sitting down having lunch in Frank's Cubby on a Friday, and I said, uh, what's everybody doing this weekend? And the chief said, I happen to be going to New York City. That's my uh, Holy Cross class reunion. I said, oh, really? Yeah. I'm taking a bum bus <laughs> out of the back. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to seeing all my college classmates. It's so wonderful. So I thought nothing of it. And that following Monday, I asked how it was. He said, it was great. Saw all my friends, reminisced. So Later on that week, I saw my daughter, Danielle. I said, hey, Danielle, how's everything going? She said, oh, we had a fabulous weekend there. Mike and I went to New York City to see Seinfeld. They love Seinfeld. They could answer any trivia question about Seinfeld. And Mike and I were in a taxi going down Park Avenue, and I swear I saw your boss walking down Park Avenue on a Saturday afternoon. And he seemed to be in a hurry, and he's wearing his beret, his blue beret, and his trench coat. But he had a man purse. <laughs> He said it couldn't have been him because he wouldn't be carrying a man purse. In the Seinfeld show, there is a man purse episode, and they talk about um, Jerry's European black leather carry bag, which is a very popular item in Europe. And that's what I thought the chief might have been carrying. So I didn't say anything for a week or so. And at lunch one day, I said, Chief, by chance, were you walking down Park Avenue at 4 o'clock, Saturday afternoon, blue beret, trench coat, carrying a man for us? <laughs> Not there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> he said, it's no 
not a man for a squad, it's a Scottish hunting pup. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what are you doing carrying a Scottish hunting pup? He said, I carry my shotgun shells in it. <laughs> I don't know why you need shotgun shells. But anyway, uh, I ask you, this is his... <laughs> interesting and challenging 10 years, and I enjoyed working with you, Chief. Frank Carney, Elizabeth Serter, Mary Rafferty, and Jennifer LaRock. I am deeply grateful to have worked with all of you. I want to thank Chief Justice Barbara Rouse, Mary Rafferty, Elizabeth Serter, Linda Serino, Estelle Cadero, Marcy Mentar, and Jim Harding for organizing this reception. To be here today as part of this unique event is a tremendous honor and privilege for me and my family. And I want to recognize and thank my family for their love and support over the years. And my beautiful wife, from 40 years. I want you to know that she was voted the prettiest girl in her senior class at Norris High School. <laughs> and believe me when I tell you, she's a saint. Our daughter Danielle and husband Michael Zenger with their five-month-old daughter Sydney. Our daughter Michelle and husband Jeffrey Gates, parents of Olivia and Charlie, ages four and two respectively. Our daughter Erin and husband attorney John McLaughlin. They are expecting their first child in October. I am proud to have served the trial court for so many years and I am very happy that I made it to the finish line. It is time to say goodbye, good luck, and God bless you. Thank you. 